Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, for me a really a great pleasure to be here. And I have a, a kind of hard task ahead of me because in, in one hour I have to give you a presentation of our museum. Uh, so I decided not to present the museum. I hope to make you curious about the museum. I hope you might come and visit. Uh, but I would like to show you actually our activity and to show the research we do and all we do behind the scenes. Uh, here you have a slide presenting some of the milestones in the museum, starting from the building from the 17th century, one of the most beautiful Baroque buildings in Turin itself, till 1824, the moment when the museum was founded, as uh, has been said, is the oldest Egyptian museum in the world. In 1824, Italy did not exist. At that time, there was uh, the region where the museum is, uh, Piedmont, with the island of Sardinia, was the so-called Kingdom of Sardinia. Um, Councillor Metternich used to say that Italy was uh, a little bit more than a geographic illusion. Uh, Italy was to be unified in 1861. But I want to remember an Italian that nobody remembers, but I de devoted to him the first room in, the, in our galleries, which is Carlo Vidua. Carlo Vidua in 1819 went to Egypt. He saw the collections uh, that was collected by Bernardino Drovetti, Consul General of France, uh, but native of Barbania nearby Turin. He had collected 5,600 objects. Well, uh, Carlo Vidua saw those objects and he wrote immediately to the King of Sardinia asking him to buy the collection. And he said, only if Turin buys this collection Italy will be a great country. I repeat, Italy did not exist at the time. So the Italy to be. And he added, because we will have the first uh, uh, gallery of antiquities in Rome, the first gallery in Florence, and the first Egyptian museum in Turing. Well, the king was convinced. It took him a couple of years. And then he decided to buy the collection and he spent 400,000 Piemontese lira, which means 60 million euros, which is, of course, a lot of money. But something else I would like you to know is three quarter of the budget of the year budget of the kingdom of Sardinia. So what a, a way of a planning. And you can understand that I've been repeating this to the Ministry of Culture every time I see him and say, well, you say now you uh, uh, invest 0.4% every year in culture. What about if you invest 75%? Well, from their own words, uh, another milestone was actually 1894 when um, Ernesto Schiaparelli became director of the museum and he realized that research was the future. The museum had to go to the field and started excavating. And then many things happens. And uh, moreover, on the 1st of April, 2015, we reopen a completely renewed museum. Just a few numbers. We have uh, more than 2 million uh, visualization on, the, uh, on our website. More than 10,000 objects of an exhibition so out of 55,000, which we have. We have more than 19 research projects, three of them European projects. We have about 900,000 visitors per year, 12,000 square, square meters, three international awards only in 2017. Well, I put the mummies because, uh, uh, well, because a museum is always linked with mummies and we will discuss about that later on. We are present in four continents. Uh, Literally, at the moment, of course, uh, in uh, Turing, because uh, we operate in Europe and we have different links uh, with different European museums. Or um, Asia, we have a Turing exhibition in China, which, has, uh, which ha had almost two million visitors in one year and a half. And we have also a Turing exhibition in Northern America. In 10 days, I'm going to Washington to open a new venue of our exhibition, Queens of Ancient Egypt. So in the last few years, uh, many publications have come out in different languages. Our exhibition in the Hermitage had uh, two and a half million visitors. And it was nice and for me natural to start our programming of uh, traveling exhibition in the Netherlands. In Leiden was my first touring exhibition. Well, I've been living and working there for 17 years, so it was nice to go back home 
and to enhance the uh, connection with our two countries and collections. Um, when I was thinking, what should I talk to you about tonight, to a diverse public and um, probably a non-Egyptologist, I decided to have a more general introduction than focusing later on what specifically we are doing uh, about what is cultural heritage, what do we do to preserve cultural heritage, what is a museum and what can we learn from an object. Last year, as you might know, was the European Year of Cultural Heritage. The European Communion uh, wanted to put at the center the fact that cultural heritage is um, in danger and that we have to preserve it. During that year, we have an exhibition which was recognized as one of the major activity within Europe uh, for the promotion of cultural heritage, and the exhibition was called Statue Also Die, and then we had an international symposium of the subject. We invited five different artists coming from the Near East to come to Turing and to exhibit some work uh, to give to us their ideas about cultural heritage. I did that, of course, as an Egyptologist because uh, as you know, a lot of things have been happening in Egypt uh, in the last few years and what is the role of the cultural heritage and how the cultural heritage has been affected. So I want to show you just two works of art uh, which help us in uh, defining the problem. This young artist, Alayari, coming from Iran, she has been uh, very struck by the destruction that has been going on in Mosul, where we have the Neo Assyrian capital, we had the Neo Assyrian capital of Nineveh, Korsabat, and Nimrud. Especially, she was struck by those objects which were completely destroyed. Here you uh, see two works of, of art which she did. What she did actually, she went to the Oriental Institute in Chicago, she pulled out all the publication, the old photos, the archive material, she studied the first photo, the first excavation, the first drawing, she reconstructed the object, she did a 3D model and then she printed them out. But if you observe the objects, you will see there are some parts very dark inside. The dark part contains a USB stick. The USB stick has inside all the information concerning the objects. So the first photograph, the first drawing, the first scientific publication, in other words, the biography of the objects. Well, ladies and gentlemen, every object has a biography. And uh, uh, every museum curator and every archeologist, every historian should help in discovery, the biography of the objects, and to express it. I tell you more, objects have more than one biography. Objects, uh, normally, uh, an object of ancient art tells at least two or three stories. The moment when it was created and when it functioned in a certain society, the moment when it died, it was forgotten and abandoned, the moment when it was excavated, rediscovered, enter in the collection history, and now, as you say in anthropology, anthropology has a connection in what uh, uh, anthropologists uh, define subject-object connection. There's also a story that we have to tell. If an object is now for 200 years in a museum, that museum is his place of memory. He has a story to tell of the connection that the object has with the visitors, with the scholars, with the artists that have been going there. Well, another artist really struck me, and is this artist, Ali Sherry. I must say that you have to do something to strike me with contemporary art, because as an Egyptologist and a specialist in the New Kingdom, sometimes I say that art died after the, nine, the 18th dynasty. So, well, you know, uh, the 18th, we are in 1350 BC. Well, to come to now is a long story. Well, I, um, I can tell you a little story. When I started excavating in Saqqara as a student, I, had, uh, I was pleased to excavate with Professor Jeffrey Martin. Uh, who used to say, well, you know, you can do whatever research that you want, but if you find coffins, coffins are mine. And I have to study the coffins. So I remember, you know, first excavation, you go to a shaft, you find coffins, so excited, you go to the professor, so well, we found coffins, so I stepped back because it's your field. 
And then he comes down and looks at the coffins and says, well, you can study them. They are disturbingly late. They are of the 21st dynasty. So, well, uh, so starting from 1070 BC. Well, this work of art is really contemporary, but it, stri uh, it strikes me because of, of, of the message that Ali Sherry wants to say, a, a kind of jacuzzi, uh, which is also a wake-up call for archaeologists. I mean, becoming conscious of what we're doing. So you see here an eagle. An eagle is hovering over some objects. The objects have been bought in the antiquity market or legally in the past two years. Some of them come from the Mediterranean, some from Rome, Greece, Near East, Levant, uh, Indonesia, and Peru. Some Egyptians as well on the back. Um, then you see they are exhibited in a light on a light table. So actually what Ali Sherry says is, the eagle is the West. The West goes all around the world, takes the objects, brings them in their own museums, and then the objects there, they are not a historical document anymore, they are just objects of art. They lose part of the biography, part of the story, I say, because they are only looked at as objects of art, but they don't tell us or the place where they come from, they don't tell what life they had, what their functions in their community, so we lose the information. Well, it's very easy to make a general accusation. It's much more painful to look at your own collection. where well, you find things like this. This is beautiful. It's a, a part of a coffin belonging to Jetot Yuf Ang, a very important priest of the 4th century BC. His brother was Petosiris, uh, uh, who has a wonderful tomb in Tuna Jebel in Egypt. He has a wonderful sarcophagus. Those of you who have been in the Cairo Museum, it's uh, one of the first objects you see when you enter your museum to the gallery on the right is a black sarcophagus with this very <coughs> nice technique. Because you see, the uh, wood has been cut and inside the wood you have glass inlay. Wonderful technique to see, not really sustainable in the long term because, well, the glass inlay would fall out. So Egyptian actually didn't use this technique for a long time. We use this coffin to teach hieroglyphs to our children. We have a copy of it, so we can insert the different uh, hieroglyphs, we can learn the shapes, and it's one of the postcards which we sell most. But when you look at it, you see something very upsetting, actually. You see that the edges has, have been cut, have been sewn, and when? When it was found. Why? because of what Professor Stephen Kirk of UCL calls the pragmatics of creating. When this collection started, of course, uh, people were very concerned about the cost of transportation. So this part was the part which was intact with a nice glass inlay. In the other part, probably the glass inlay was gone, so you would only have the carving, which will tell us, would tell us, by the way, information about the biography of the person, and, but it was not seen as a beautiful object of art, so it was discarded. So is a museum a place of conservation or a place of destructions? Probably both. And I see you, I show you another very nice object. Uh, it's about to go to an exhibition in Marseille, well, which will be called Pharaoh Superstar. Well, the superstar you see in this beautiful face, when you see the almond-like eyes, the elongated nose, the fully lips, the elongated face, all typical features of the 18th dynasty. And if some of you have had a little bit of Egyptology, look a little bit more careful, you will also recognize some features of King Akhenaten and his son, King Tutankhamun. Well, wonderful, you would say, a piece of this king, but there is a problem because when you, we look at the back and we read the hieroglyphs, we see the cartouche and inside the cartouche there is a name and the name is Wahib Re, a king of the 26th dynasty. How is it possible? Wahib Re and then Tutankhamun, well, something is going wrong. When it's nice to look at the history of the object, the back pillar is original. It was on sale on the antiquity market in 1947 in Egypt. It was not bought. Then the objects completely disappeared from sight until in 2001 the Italian police called the Museo Egizio and forced the Museo Egizio to buy the objects by Italian law, 
by our uh, conservation law from 1902, then reinforced in 1939, then reinforced uh, by um, our law on antiquities of 2004. Every piece which is of vital importance for the history of the nation has to be acquired by public institutions. Dutch, for instance, have very different law concerning that. Uh, the, uh, the Dutch royal family uh, can now sell um, sketch uh, and drawings without selling them to a public institution. In Italy, we're not allowed. Well, anyway, it was bought, brought to Turin, and then we discovered that the back pillar is original. The head is just a forgery. Why was it made? To enhance the value of the objects, because, of course, we all know that after the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922, there was a kind of tooth mania in Europe. So what does an object is in a museum? It also has a value. Uh, there is an art market. So the object in, in a museum functions in a different way compared to the way it functions in its archaeological context, and we have to be aware of that. Having said that, of course, when I arrived in Turing, I say that I have done only one big thing in Turin, which I'm very proud, which is giving back the excavation to the museum. An archaeological museum, in my view, has to excavate. Without excavation, you do lose the link with uh, your uh, territory, you lose the knowledge, you lose that part of the story that you have to tell concerning the objects. Uh, many people ask me, can you bring back objects when you go to Egypt? No, of course we can't, and I think it's very right so. Uh, we bring back knowledge. We understand who we are. Uh, we understand the people to whom the objects uh, who, that we house in the museum belong to. Where do we excavate? We excavate in Saqqara. Uh, I had the honor and the privilege to be uh, co-director of the Dutch excavation in Saqqara, and now I'm co-director of the Italian Dutch excavation in Saqqara. Uh, where do we excavate? Well, in a wonderful place. Well, this is the walk we have every morning. We live in the desert uh, and uh, in the plateau in Saqqara. Then every morning we have half an hour work to our walk to our site. Uh, we excavate in the tombs of the high official of the 18th dynasty. To tell you only some, Maya in Egyptian, Imi Per Hejnezut, the responsible of the treasure of the pharaoh, and the pharaoh was Tutankhamun. Hormeb, the general of the pharaoh who became himself king, etc. Where do we work? Well, you see, Saqqara, so we are 200 meters to the south of the step pyramid of King Djoser. The small mount that you see um, on your left side is also a pyramid. It's a pyramid of King Unas, the first pyramid with pyramid text. And we see us walking to the site. We opened a trench to the north of the tomb of Maya. We opened up uh, 20 meters because we want to investigate what has been going on after the abandonment uh, at the end of the 18th dynasty, how was the reuse in the uh, 200 years later in the Ramesside period, how was the use in the late period of what happened in late antiquities and the 19th century. And sometimes you have very nice surprises. So in this general view, you see a huge hole in the beginning, and you might ask, what is that? Well, that is the archaeology of the 19th century which we are finding back. Uh, uh, the deputy director of the museum, uh, Dr. Paolo Del Vesco, is working on something which is becoming more and more is a research topic, the archaeology of plundering, as he calls it, which is when, in the 19th century, we went to the site in order to find precious objects to bring them back to our museums, which sometimes meant destroying different layers and destroying forever information. Something that I keep telling my students, archaeology is destructive. Probably there is nothing so destructive in human activities as, as archaeology. We don't build, we take out layers. That's why we have to be very careful, very meticulous, very precise to document everything and not what we are interested in, everything. Because when we lose information, the information lost forever. And then you have to be inventive. Because uh, in Egypt, as the time being, is uh, 
forbidden to use drones. So with the Department of Engineering of the Politecnico of Milan, uh, we use what we call the poles. We put uh, poles next to each other and then we reach a height of uh, three meters. On top of it, we have a, a camera when there is a guy going around with a kind of vest where he put his poles and then you can have an aerial photography. And then you see a lot of um, features which uh, makes us understand what is awaiting for us because this is the end of the excavation next year. We are going back uh, in a few weeks time, inshallah. So first of all, this building appeared and that you see very clearly a corner here, a corner here. This is a monumental entrance. We see it's made of uh, mud bricks and is a monumental entrance of a tomb of the 18th dynasty. You, you see two columns, the uh, slabs of, um, in uh, uh, limestone which are appearing on the west are probably chapels. So there is uh, a tomb waiting for us. We hope the normal way they are constructed is you have mud bricks and against mud bricks you have slabs of limestone which are decorated with hieroglyphs and well probably the name of the owners which we hope to find here next year. Here you see white limestones everywhere which is a secondary occupation of the site slightly later around the time of King Ramses II. The level is higher because actually to build these tombs and to build the shafts, they took out a lot of debris. With the debris, they leveled the, uh, um, the area, and on top of it, they built smaller tombs like this with a little chapel and a shaft. A tomb in ancient Egypt is always a dichotomy. You have a chapel when you bring offers, which has to be as complete, as beautiful as possible to raise the level of the family in society because it functions for the living. And therefore, the disease, you have a shaft normally uh, eight or nine meters deep where you find, well, the coffins and whatever. In this area, we have a later occupation of the uh, beginning of the Christian era uh, because, as we know, the early Copts went to the desert to live in isolation and meditation and uh, in prayer. And actually, um, some of them were living here. We are very nearby the so-called monastery of Appa Jeremias. Well, of course, what do we do? Documentation is fundamental. So with photogrammetry, we document, for instance, the shaft going down. Well, you see the opening wherever the shaft with a room on the south, which we still have to excavate, and a room on the north, we've already have been excavating. We haven't found anything, but if you look carefully, you see these black spots actually all over the tomb. The tomb was probably plundered in antiquity and then set on fire, which was typical. Uh, they used to set the uh, tombs on fire in order to have everything burned except gold, metals, and other precious elements they wanted to save. In the meantime, we are documented all the necropolis with photogrammetry because we are very uh, cautious that we need to document to posterity. Uh, we do it, of course, on the site. When we have uh, our uh, 3D model, we'll translate in bidimensional uh, um, drawings. Of course, uh, we fight very hard to make people understand that archaeology is not about discovery. Archaeology is about the process. Archaeology is science. Archaeology is research. And it's very important. It seems obvious, but people tell things all the time that we are just uh, Indiana Jones uh, going there and jumping into beautiful rooms. Archaeology is patient. Archaeology is documentation. Archaeology, I, I repeat, is science. Having said that, sometimes you have your workman that calls you over and says, please come and have a look. And then, well, you are kind of struck. This is coming out of the sand. You see faces are coming out. You, well, we can recognize two men, two women, and after cleaning them, we, we see that there is a chapel with three-dimensional statues coming out of the wall. So the statue carved in the limestones they are 53 centimeters high. This was so important because there were no parallels. I mean, we have a register like this in the Louvre, 
and one in, in Paris and one in, uh, um, in Naples. But we didn't know that it was coming from the uh, ground level. We always thought it was higher up in a chapel. But actually in front of it, there was a uh, offering table and people would put offering the offering table, going their knees, and they would be in high sight with their ancestors. Two men in Ramaside clothes with their wives. So I just want to, uh, I, I try to schematize what kind of questions do we try to answer when we have an object in front of us. Well, very schematic, I would say. What is it? Where was it done? And I would add, where was it found? And then, if you answer this question, sometimes you can say, what? I didn't expect that. Well, first of all, let's try with one object. This object is a box belonging to Ha. I will show you Ha in a very few minutes. It's the only intact tomb of the New Kingdom preserved outside of Egypt, found on the 15th of February 1906, but I will bring you on the 15th of February 1906 very soon. When, where was this tomb? Well, this tomb is in the middle of, in the south of Egypt, what we call Upper Egypt, in the west bank of Luxor. Uh, so the west bank is the place of the dead in the village which we call of Dur el Medina. In ancient Egyptian, it was called Pa Demi, the village. It's a wonderful village. Uh, founded in 1550 by Ahmes Nefertari and her son, Hamenotep I. 200 uh, people, in the beginning 200, 300 people, whose task was that of building the tombs in the Valley of the Queens and the Valley of the Kings. The village was discovered at the, uh, in the 19th century, was excavated by the director of the Museo Egizio from 1903, and from 1921, the IFAO, l'Institut Française d'Archéologie Orientale, works there, and I'm very glad that next year we will be working together with them and going back in the field. 15 of February, 1906, what happened? Well, a museum, of course, is a collection of objects, but a museum is a research center, so a museum is also a library, an archive. We have 39 linear meters of unpublished archive. We have 20,000 uh, glass negatives containing the archaeological photos of the moment of the discovery. Well, together with our engineers, we put together the photos, we made them immersive, so I bring you back on that moment on the 9, 15th of February 1906. Uh, the workmen of Schiaparelli were working 29 meters from the so-called chapel of Ha. Ha was Imi Erkaut Nezut, responsible of the works of the pharaoh. He was working in the time of Amenophis II and, well, we were about to the moment of discovery is tomb. And now we are entering the tomb, just putting the drawings and the photographs of Schiaparelli together. And we are going back on that um, uh, 15 of February. So an opening was found. The opening was eight meters deep. At the end of this opening, the shaft was a first staircase blocked off with this wall. When this wall was taken out, there was another room even blocked off and then Caprelli found himself in front of this door, still sealed, and he wrote in his diary, the moment of resurrection has arrived. And in putting together the photographs, we can enter the burial chamber with him and see the wonder he found. He found 460 objects there. See the sarcophagi of Ha and Merit still covered with the linen, bread, jars still containing the residues, flowers, well, uh, uh, clothes, as I say, a complete tomb of the responsible of the works of the pharaohs. And now I would like, together with you, to discover some of the objects which were inside. <coughs> well, sometimes you need to do a macro XRF to understand the composition of the pigments. And why do we do want to do that? Well, for you cannot do safeguarding conservation of the objects if you don't know the objects. But sometimes, uh, it's not only for conservation issues, not, not sometimes always, but it's also to realize, to get to understand the objects much better. Doing a XRF mapping, we found copper, 
we found our Senicom, all things we were inspected, there was something we were not inspected, which was black manganese. We were not expecting it at all. And actually, we started then doing macro XRF in different objects. We did it on the papyrus, and it turned out something very interesting. Look what is in green, the hieroglyphs and some details. And all of a sudden, it appears clear how they were working. Like the master was doing that, and his apprentice was doing something else. Uh, well, yeah, we can do it also in false color. And actually, what we can do with every object, doing from visible light to UV to infrared to uh, um, UV false color, we can sometimes determine and see what normally we would not be able to see. We could go from visible to invisible. What would you, would you do if you had an intact tomb to preserve, which we have, and you have jars still sealed? They are sealed from 1350. Well, the temptation, as many colleagues ask us, to open them and do residue analysis. I mean, we have the remains of oil, beer, wine, and oil is very important to start with because in ancient Egypt we always talk about the seven sacred oils and we don't know what oils they were. We still use the name in Egyptian. So it would be very interesting to make an analysis to uh, um, um, determine the presence of atom or carbon atoms to see how they decayed, what they are, their, uh, um, how they are linked to each other and to understand what kind of oil was. But how could I with such a container, break the seal with the name of the pharaoh, take out the textiles, take out the metal which is covering it, and go through the uh, um, clay. Well, actually, we don't do that for the time being, because also I think we have to be humble, and I will show you in a little while why we should be humble, and to realize that what we can do up to now, we should do. And sometimes we also have to say, well, maybe we have to wait because maybe I don't see it in my lifetime. I maybe mean, in 50 years from now, in 100 years from now, there will be another technique which will allow us to determine what is the contents without ruining the object. Anyway, we went to a um, neutron activation lab in uh, uh, Oxfordshire. Uh, called, uh, well, it's called ISIS, but uh, has nothing to do uh, with other organizations with the same name, thanks God. But uh, um, it was also very interesting because um, uh, it's quite expensive to go there. You have to pay quite a large amount of money per hour to use the machinery. But when we discussed to the director and told him how important this tomb was, he was so enthusiastic that we could use for 12 days 24 hours a day is the machinery free of charge. So actually, finally, now we have the morphology of the vases because, as you know, if you do a CT scan of X-rays of an albust uh, container, you would have just, and now you can see the shape and you can see, see inside the content. Sometimes something apparently funny turns out. So this jar seems to be empty. It only seems to have something on the back and completely empty, which is kind of weird. But when you see at the content inside, when you realize that there is a, a, is a kind of conglomerate, which is in the interaction with the clay which was there, plus the liquid, because when we did the 3D model, it would not go through the neck of the jar. I said mummies. Well, we are so proud that we have 270 mummies, one of the largest collections in the world, completely preserved. And it's completely preserved because those who discovered the mummy, which is Professor Schiaparelli, said at a certain point, there will be a moment when we will be able to look inside the mummy without damaging them. In a moment, at the beginning of the 20th century, where it was very normal, to dissect the mummies in public viewing where people would be so excited to go to a museum and see what was inside. So actually what you are seeing now has never been seen by the discoverer, has never been seen by my public either, because uh, I'm showing you some preview of an exhibition which we are opening on the 12th of March. So we, first of all, we rent a, a CT scan and we had the CT scan come to the museum. 
it was much easier than uh, going to the hospital, first of all, because when you go to the hospital, you have always to compete with uh, patients, of course, or, or, or uh, uh, patients would be not so happy to have mummies be scanning instead of them. And then, of course, you have all the transport to the hospital. And by Italian law, it's quite difficult uh, because uh, even though the hospital is very well willing and say, well, we can give you an ambulance, ambulance are meant for leaving people. And so uh, the director told me, can you do something? Well, there's nothing I can do. I cannot say the mummies are alive. And so uh, we uh, rented a CT scan outside of the museum and we CT scanned all the mummies. And so, among others, the mummy of Kha, whose tomb we house has been found intact. And so we found that it has a wonderful gold color, which is called the gold of honor, which the pharaoh would give to the high official who had done something spectacular for, their, uh, for the state. We see that he has all kind of jewels in the public area. His wife, Merit, Merit means the one whom he loves, has this wonderful waza color and very heavy earrings, and we see that uh, the spine and the thorax have been heavily damaged. Then, uh, in already in 1960, Professor Curto, which you see here, was director of the museum from 1960, uh, 1946 to 1981. He brought uh, x-rays in the museum to make analysis, and he already saw that it was this color which resembled the color of honor, as we see here, for instance, in a slab from Leiden from the tomb of horror map. Now, with a modern CT scan we did, we can go inside and literally look inside the car. So I'm showing you uh, a prototype, which will be um, shown in the exhibition, because on the 12th of March, for the first time, we will show the um, mummy of Kha, and uh, uh, Merit still wrapped. And next to it, there will be the uh, wheelchair and wrapping and then the 3D printing of the jewels. Because now, for the first time, we can see face-to-face -face how it's preserved. You see part of the skin is well preserved, part is not. We see that he has jewels. We see that he has a wonderful heart scarab hanging from a golden chain with a gold framework around it. And probably the heart scarab is inscribed with Book of the Dead, chapter 30A or 30B. We can now detect the lines, but we are not able to read the hieroglyphs yet. Well, we will get there. And now we are in the process of printing all these objects. We have found that his wife, Merit, has a wig. Well, of course, we have already a wig of merit in our exhibition, wig of uh, real hair. But in reading the CT scan, we found that she's wearing a second wig, which is still inside the mummy, and is as long as the waist, completely preserved. So you see that you can isolate only the amulets or only <coughs> the metal and gold. Well, we have a lot of objects that we have to take care of, starting from coffins, which are very complex um, artifacts. Uh, coffins are not painted wood. Coffin is wood with clay on top of it, with textile to keep the clay together, with huntite on top of it, and then all the colored layer, which means a lot of cautious in conservations. Of course, our statuary, uh, we are working with the University of Turin for the monitoring of our statues because uh, we have to be very careful to move them when we see the weak points. And well, you can understand why we move them. Uh, uh, I always almost have a, a heart attack. Uh, and before you move them, you have to know how to move them. We have one of the most important textile collections in the world. Look at the photos that Scaparelli made of the textiles of Ha in the very moment he discovered them and took out of their um, uh, boxes. We have of Ha, I repeat the date, 1350 BC. This tunic have not been restored. They are just as they were, completely intact. And look at something else. Everything 
of the uh, textile of Ga has been signed. Sometimes with the name written in extension, like here, this is a so-called two-literal uh, um, sign, which we read Ga, the phonetic complement A. So here we read Ga, then an, uh, ancient hieroglyphs work with the so-called determinative. So signs normally are phonograms, so they are used because they express a sound. But at the end of the signs, you put uh, an object which tells you to which semantic category the word belongs to. So here you see a book row, which means, OK, the word before is a, something abstract. And then you see uh, the determinative of man. So abstract, personal name, belonging to a man. So here's the name. Ha. Well, it's either written out, all we have is anagram, is either um, assumed in the textile or written with ink based on iron. Why? Because iron would not dissolve in water. And why would we have all his uh, address signed? Because there was a service of public laundry. And so, well, you needed to know to whom the, the dresses belong to in order to be able to give it back. And uh, this, you might understand what it is, is it his underwear. We have more than 50 pairs of underwear. Uh, I always say, it sounds not nice, I always say it's used underwear, not in the sense that it's dirty, but in the sense that, of course, it was used in life and put in his tomb. So we are doing a huge work on all the textiles in uh, well, detecting, first of all, the state of conservation. One of the huge tasks we have, for instance, is once you unwrap them and you register everything, you cannot wrap them back, of course, because they're too fragile. So we are always running out of space. And then we document uh, everything. We do copy with uh, experimental archaeology so that we can uh, detect how they were used. Then, of course, there is all the preservation mechanical cleaning, and then sometimes this wonderful representation with inscriptions come out. Rehydration uh, of the uh, textiles, uh, the fibers are completely dried out. So you have to be very careful in putting back a little bit of water, vaporizing it so that the textiles can, um, uh, cannot uh, avoid in breaking. Uh, of course, with digital, we reconstruct like this very nice Coptic tunic, and we can well insert the pieces that we have and give an image to the public which makes it completely comprehensive, and we study the best way to exhibit the textiles. We not only have any, uh, human mummies, but we also have animals mummies. So here again, we had a CT scan out of the museum, with humans, we were very respectful, of course. With animal, we only added that research in our place is continuous, and there are animals on board. And that had a huge effect because all the children who gather around them were very struck by this. So, of course, all kinds of animals. We have cats, we have mice, we have snakes, we have falcons, we have ibis, we have crocodile. We sometimes are in nice surprise. Look at our huge crocodile, uh, 2 meter 90. And then, look at that a very small, tiny crocodile just in the front. Because, ladies and gentlemen, ancient Egyptians were very pragmatic. Well, why would you use such an offering to go to the temple and to offer to the god Sobek? Of course, the god has to be pleased. But the people has to see also how pious you are. And, well, if you offer such a huge crocodile, it's amazing, but a huge crocodile is very expensive to have an adult crocodile killed and mummified. So. Why not having a baby and then do the wrapping of the mummy as if it's of an adult so you have maximum result with the less expensive. And so we sign all the time. Sometimes we have a falcon mummy and inside the falcon mummy there is only one feather. Uh, and I'll tell you a story that happened to me. I uh, had an exhibition in Japan, which was called Fascinating Mummies. I was working in the Netherlands, and then we repatriated the mummies. And, um, of course, uh, we did all the paperwork, and I went back to my office, and then the following days, people from the police came uh, to the museum, and then they called me from the desk, and they said, well, the police wants to talk to you. And I said, well, let them come to my office. And so they started, you know, 
with animals. There is very restrictive law in uh, Europe because you want to avoid illegal trading of species which are protected. So uh, they said, well, you repatriated three falcons, but you only have requests for one. And I said, well, don't worry, I had the x-ray, so I showed them and said, well, look, one is real, the other one are only feathers. So, well, it calmed down. But then, he said, but there is another problem, because you didn't ask uh, permission uh, for the repatriation of this snake. I had a mummy of a snake. I mean, I had a package, and inside the package there were three snakes, and one of which was probably identified by the specialist with this species of snake uh, whose import is strictly forbidden in Europe. So this official told me, do you have attestation that he was born in captivity? I couldn't believe that. So I told him, <laughs> I will ask Ptolemy II. And then he didn't understand. And then I said, do you know how old is this uh, um, a mummy, and he said, no, tell me. And I told him, it's the, uh, the second century BC. And then he uh, relaxed and he said, well, it's much earlier than European legislation. I said, yes, <laughs> much earlier. So I could import it without a problem. So, well, dealing with mummies, we have all kinds of mummies, cats, baboons, as, uh, and the conservation is also quite complicated. Um, we do go from mechanical cleaning, as you see here, with, uh, with very so uh, Hoover cleaning, with this humifier, where you puncture, you try to give back humidity to inserting some uh, stripes of textile, completely reversible, completely inert, completely different color, so that you can see what you inserted, to try to give back the shape, and so, only from the cleaning and rehydration, you go from this to that. Of course, we work together with many different professionals, including engineers, to understand what kind of solution is the best in order to house the collections. And sometimes, you know, of mummies, only a few rest remains, like this poor dog is what we have. But the project, probably, that I'm more proud of is our papyrus project. We have more than 20,000 fragments of papyrus in uh, like this, fragmentary. We have the most important administrative archive, uh, ancient archive, coming from ancient Egypt. And I decided when I arrived at the Museo Egizio to change the strategy. Normally, it would be normal that the director would appoint a philologist, the philologist would devote all his or her life to study the fragments and then recompose three, four, five documents, public five or six monographs in his or her life. But then we still have 20,000 projects, uh, fragments not published. Well, this is the moment with digital and new technologies that we can, uh, having enhance our way of working. First of all, we developed a theoretical framework. We did, we did a distinction between what is an object, what is a document, and what is a witness. For us, every single fragment is an object. It has to be. We have to give to all these collections an inventory number. It's fundamental. They don't have an inventory number yet. It's fundamental to give it to them, because otherwise, things which do not have an inventory number can disappear, is fundamental within a museum. Then, we didn't, shouldn't say, well, one <coughs> object, one document, absolutely not. One object has inside many different texts. Sometimes a tiny piece of papyrus can have 10 different handwritings, because papyrus was very precious, papyrus are palimpsests, could be used and reused. Every single text for us is a witness. A witness of what? Of a major document. So in one tiny fragment, I can have parts of 10 different documents that I can reconstruct together. What are we doing? We have developed a cooperative software where we scan and upload all these pieces. We have in cooperation of a group of the University of Basel, Liège, Munich, Oxford, Copenhagen, and Leiden. Together, with this software, 
the uh, objects can be seen within our group. We are developing a, a virtual light table. What, where can we do? We can do a puzzle, a huge puzzle, and recompose the object. First thing we do, we put them in order of shape, as you see here. So this piece is here, this piece is here. And now this piece went here, this went here. We know from the fibers how they can be recomposed, and this is a wonderful Ramaside letter. Sometimes having a very good scan even of the fibers is important because sometimes you know that two fragments belong together, but maybe one is at the beginning of the text, one is at the end. Only the type of papyrus can tell you whether they belong together. It's a huge work, we just uh, started, but we are very happy of having this group and we have been um, now honored by a European uh, grant which will allow us to enhance the work. We are studying the ink. We are studying ink in cooperation with the University of Roma La Sapienza and the University of Oslo and Bergen. And it's very important because once again, we have one of the most important collection of ancient manuscripts. We have manuscripts, ladies and gentlemen, of the result of the Concile of Nicaea, which was, uh, 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 those very documents are in our museum. So sometimes even to detect the ink tells us where we were written, where we were coming from. Of course, everything has to be published and uh, we decided to have a journal online uh, in, uh, um, the, um, on our website where the articles are in Italian, German, French and English let's say uh, the languages which are used, mostly used, Italian not so much, but since we are in Italian Museum, I found it was more than normal that people were also allowed to publish in Italian, and then there is a summary in Arabic. It's online, uh, it's a peer-reviewed, double peer-reviewed journal. Um, we needed to have a central collector where scientific um, results could be seen by each other. And uh, it's not a PDF, but it's HTML format. So you can go inside, have a 3D model, zoom in, uh, and actually gives a lot of opportunity also for scholars all around the world. I'm going towards the end, and I want to tell you that I'm, we are very, very honored and happy that after three years of uh, hard work, we have been honored by um, a very nice uh, grant from the European delegation in Cairo to uh, transform the museum in Tahrir Square in Cairo. Our Egyptian colleagues, together with us, uh, will work together in order to rethink completely the museum. We, are, we have uh, two years to write a master plan. A master plan has to be complete, and well, I will show you in a minute the work um, um, projects. The partners, well, we are uh, the project leader, which is Museo Egizio. We have the Museo del Louvre, British Museum, Egyptisches Museum und Papyrumsammlung, and Rijksmuseum van Outeden, uh, in cooperation with some other institutes. Um, of course, the major and most important cooperation is the Ministry of Antiquities and uh, a committee of Egyptian Museum, Cairo. Uh, well, this is the calendar how we went there, but uh, what is very important is we have three working packages. The first one is the redisplay of the entrance galleries, which we have to finish by April 2020, uh, where our museum will be working. Then we have the completion of the master plan for June 2020 and the redisplay of the Tarian's royal tombs by December 2020, which will be done by uh, uh, the Louvre. Uh, well, the money is not so important for you. Uh, it is very important uh, that uh, uh, the large European collections will work hand in hand with our uh, uh, Egyptian colleagues. In uh, uh, we will mutual learn from each other in what we want to really call Umaldunia. Really, this museum is the mother of the world, is the mother of Egyptology, is the mother of our discipline, is the most important museum we have. I uh, would like to show you uh, very quickly some of uh, uh, the, uh, how, what we can do 
well, with the result uh, we are doing in cooperation with the Vatican Museum and now also with the uh, uh, Polytechnico of Milan, we did a, uh, a 3D model of our uh, coffin of Bute Amon, the last scribe of Dero Medina, of the village of the artists of Dero Medina, the son of Jehutimes, who was also himself a scribe, probably the one who moved uh, the village from Dero Medina to the temple of Medinet Habu to the south. His uh, coffin is of extreme importance because it's a kind of transition from uh, uh, what are the normal uh, new kind of coffins to what they are called uh, yellow coffins. The uh, um, reproduction is done with submillimetric precision in order to detect many different things and we want this to be a beginning of a kind of digital encyclopedia where we can link up all the information because then we can have the x-rays, the CT scans, the conservation, so it can be like a kind of Google map inside the coffin where you can see all the different materials, where you can see all the Egyptological information, all the uh, analytical information. A museum has to be a place, uh, we said, of research. By my view, has to be more and more also a place of education. Uh, we have the paradox sometimes in Italy that we have a large cultural heritage by our students of history of art and archaeology. They study in their classrooms, they not study in the museum. The Louvre in Paris is a wonderful example how you can have Le Col du Louvre, how you can put university inside the museum and together work in the material culture also to teach to archaeologists and art historians that an object also has a materiality. Not only because sometimes when you talk to Egyptologists and you ask them about a coffin, they tell you all the Book of the Dead chapters on that coffin, forgetting that it's made of something, forgetting that this has implication, economical implication, historical implication, forgetting, for instance, that there was no wood in Egypt, which meant that you would go to Lebanon to fetch food, which meant that when in the third intermediate period where you were not able to uh, navigate to uh, Lebanon anymore, the coffins were reused, and 70% of the coffins of the third intermediate period are reused. More and more, people want to have a museum as what we call the participatory museum, and we read in uh, English and American literature things that uh, the matter of making museums, which is becoming a sign in itself, well, I want to end showing you two projects which we did, which I'm particularly proud. When I arrived in the museum, I said, well, of course, I want to make the museum a research center. And then I said, I have a dream. I want to bring the museum outside of the museums. I believe, as Philippe de Montebello used to say, that a museum is not a suspended society. A, mu a museum lives inside and radicating in the city where it lives, in the region where it is, in the nation, and belongs to mankind in general. And if it belongs to society, it belongs to society at large, and there are part of society that cannot come to museum. Well, example, well, the first example is the children hospital. Children that are not able to come to the museum because they are too ill, because uh, well, we are working with the oncologist, oncological department, and children cannot get out. So what we did, I first started, I went there, I gave some classes, then my curators took it over for me, and they started going to teach the children. And it's very moving for the children, but also for us, because it teaches you a lot, also to be flexible, because when you are dealing with patients, uh, who uh, immune system is very low, you know at the very last moment whether you're allowed to go or not. And the children would really like here, you see one of our curators teaching them hieroglyphs and uh, making them work. But there was something we were asking all the time, can we have the objects? Well, that's difficult because every time you have to organize art, transport, insurance, etc., it wouldn't be possible. And I never thought that the answer to this wish of the children would come me, to me by another place, which I'd never thought I would work in, and, and it came from by a phone call I received from this director of this place, and this place is the jail. The Turin jail, we had, is a, uh, there are more than 1,500 people in that jail of different uh, 
by ground, uh, more than the half uh, is coming from abroad. And so we went there, we lectured them, we talked to them about the tomb of Kha. And in the jail, they have a program, rehabilitation program, and they can get also their A-levels, do high school, and they do it in art and craft. They were so struck by the tomb of Kha that they decided to make uh, to be engaged with that and to make copies for these children. And when we saw the result, we were completely amazed. So this is the beauty case of merit, the copy they made. They study how to make the box, they study how to produce faience, how to color it, and the result is this. They copied by hand the 14, 40 meters 50 of the Book of the Dead of Kha and Merit, making, copying by hand and painting the cursive hieroglyphs, making something which is absolutely amazing. The moment when we got it back and they came to the museums, uh, my curators were completely struck by the beautiful, or how beauty, uh, the beautiful these objects were. And now, first of all, we had uh, a small exhibition in uh, around Christmas, our museum, which we call it Free to Learn. Then the same exhibition is going to the, is right now in the tribunal. And then the children in the hospital will use the objects uh, to make an exhibition inside the hospital and they will write the labels. So, so two places which are part of society, which can be linked with the museum. And I tell you, what I really like is that when you, for instance, go to the jail, it's quite a hard experience, you don't talk about your background, you're all equal. And then uh, there was this guy that told me, he came to me and he thanked me and he said, you know, thanks to the fact that now we have to work and, to, and we have a goal, I, I, I wake up at night thinking, how do, am I gonna solve that problem? How can I make that box? And I don't think about the idea that I'm here. So I think sometimes art and archeology span can help. We are working very hard to uh, reach a goal that's saying that a museum is from everybody. So we have the reduction from children, for if you're over 60, the day of women, you have a reduction, uh, the day of the uh, mom, when uh, it's on Valentine's Day, uh, the Father's Day, and then uh, university students get reductions, and then the day of the birthday, everybody can get in the museum for free. And then I launched a program that also uh, those who come, um, who speak Arabic, can come in the museum for free, which was a gift. And uh, we did it only, uh, actually, it's not they can come in the museum for free. Those who speak Arabic, if they come with a friend, and a friend can be Italian, Arabic, whatever it is, only one of them pays. And why did I do that? In order to say that we have the huge responsibility to have the second most important collection in the world, and we are extremely grateful to Egypt for what uh, it has done. Without Egypt, we wouldn't have these collections. So we look, of course, at Egypt first and foremost in the first place. And we also think that the collection can eradicate if we think at the citizens of the future. This was not really taken very well from uh, some um, Italian politicians, so we had um, to fight against it. But uh, uh, it happened that uh, we organized uh, an evening uh, on the International Refugee Night. We organized this evening saying, I'm welcome. And I was very tense because it was uh, known taken well by um, the right wing party and we thought, well, how is it going to work? And it was amazing. And with this, I want to end my lecture. So we opened the museum on a look at how the people responded. Every single organization in the city took a well. The university came in mass. We had more than 17 choirs in the museum. The oldest choir of the University of Turing came there. And so we had actors, we have dancers, and we uh, told everybody, you can come, you don't need to pay, you do only need to leave us a post-it with your name uh, and saying why you think people are welcome. And it was a wonderful mix because we had people who had just arrived as refugees in their boats. We had people who, uh, Italians, as you see, uh, new Italians, uh, all the Italian, and all were linked with music, culture, reading, trying to connect to the objects and has been uh, really amazing. And what I was really 
touched by is that in a moment when we were attacked for an activity we were doing, then the city responded in such a way which we had more than 3,800 people in one night uh, from 7 o'clock in the night until 11 o'clock. And uh, uh, so with these images where I think that uh, the message that I would like to give is that if we study the biography of the objects, if we understand the objects, there is a way where we not only can enhance the knowledge um, about the objects themselves, but also enhance the knowledge about ourselves. And actually, we can really build bridges and uh, take down walls. Um, and you know, in a, um, anthropology, it's more and more important to, to understand what is the, the dependence from objects. Ian Hoder wrote a wonderful book called Entangled, to see how the material culture is dependent on man, but how man is dependent on material culture. And especially with an archaeological museum is uh, something I think is very important. And for the safeguarding of the cultural heritage, cultural heritage has to be known. This is uh, part of the team of the museum. And uh, well, the nice welcome wall, we kept all the post-its, which uh, will help us in um, going on. So, as I told you, I didn't show the museum, but some of the activities we have, and I really hope to welcome you in Turing. Thank you.